after Jesus himself, the most important figure in the development of Christianity is the Apostle Paul. And Paul's career was unique because he is probably the most important single apostle to the Roman Empire, to the peoples that lived in the Mediterranean basin. The Christian message, which began as a heretical sect of Christianity, was turned into a world historical religion during the time of Paul, and particularly during his three long missionary journeys throughout the eastern part of the Mediterranean. Now, Paul's background is very important for understanding the significance of Paul in early Christianity. He was a Hellenistic Jew, he was a Roman citizen, and he studied the Jewish law under a highly respected and highly regarded rabbi. Now, he was extremely devout, and his religious faith never wavered, even during the conversion experience which caused him to move from Judaism to Christianity. He never gave up on the idea of Yahweh, on the idea of a universal moral law, and the career which he had made him the single most important interpreter of Christian doctrine during the earliest phase of Christianity. His main journeys, are, or his most important journeys, happened during the 50s, and he himself is about the same age as Jesus, they're rough contemporaries. And prior to undertaking his missionary task throughout the, uh, the Roman Empire, he had actually been persecuting Christians. He had been part of the reaction against this nascent Jewish sect, and he'd been trying to make sure that this heresy didn't spread and flourish. This was continuous and consistent with his idea of piety. Because he was faithful to God's law, because he was a sincere and devout religious believer at every phase in his life, even prior to the conversion on the road to Damascus, what we see then is a change in Paul in the, the instrumentalities of his piety. The piety itself, I don't think fundamentally changed. He may have found different ways of expressing it, but he was a pious and extremely religious individual from the very outset. So Paul, more than most of the apostles which were drawn into Jesus' early circle or drawn into uh, the circle of early Christianity, had a very strong religious background, had a very strong connection to the traditions of Judaism. Now, his conversion experience is possibly, after the miracles of Jesus himself, the most famous event in the New Testament. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece that's narrated in several places, um, particularly in Cor Corinthians. He talks about it at some length. He talks about what it was like to be moving on the road to Damascus. And the journey motif, the fact that Paul is on the road to Damascus, that he's going from some place to some place else, makes all the difference because his whole life is a sort of spiritual journey. And the actual physical journeys that he undertakes are mere representations, externalizations of the spiritual journey that Paul's life amounts to. So the fact that he's on the road to Damascus, he's moving from one place to another place, persecuting Christianity as, it, as he goes, is fraught with important symbolic significance for our understanding of Paul. So, he's on the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden, some unique event occurs to him. And it's very hard to, to determine exactly what it was. Um, described as an overwhelming presence of the Lord, which caused him to be blind. And of course, the blindness that he gets from his encounter with God is correspondent to the state of moral blindness, the state of moral iniquity that, or moral incompleteness that Paul finds himself in at this time. Afterwards, he is cured by a Christian believer, not cured, but he has his blindness removed in his contact with a Christian believer. And Paul always said, this more than anything else made me not only an apostle, but maybe willing to put my whole life on the line for the spread and development of Christianity. Now, when he has this conversion experience, it seems that there are at least two things that, happens to, that happen to him. One, he has this blindness, but two, he has certain theological insights, epiphanies, in his connection with God. And the first thing he realizes is that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. This is a proposition that he had spent his life trying to combat. He had been working on the assumption that Jesus had been a, Jesus had been a false prophet, that he had not been the Messiah. So he has a complete 180 degree turnaround in his theological outlook. The result of this is what will become in the Middle Ages called the Imitatio Christi. He decided to do the best he could to have his life imitate the life of Christ. 
So this transmission of the good news, the spreading of Jesus' message outside the domain of Israel is the thing to which he has devoted his life, and it is his way of re-representing the Jesus story. So he is on a moral journey. He is trying, insofar as it is possible, perhaps it's one of the things incumbent upon the believing Christian, to try and imitate Christ in one's own life. And Paul does that in a kind of unique and particularly intense way. Now, he undertakes three missionary journeys. He, is, he spends a great deal of time moving from, from city to city, uh, following the trade routes. And what he was trying to do is make sure that Christian churches are established and flourish and develop within these major trade cities. And as a result of that, Christianity becomes perhaps not the, the dominant force in the Roman Empire because it's a small number of people, but it is a very mobile element of the empire because they are not for the most part sedentary people. In many cases the Christians are living in cities that have tremendous uh, commercial connections with the other cities of the empire. So Christianity moves along the commercial trade routes. Paul is an important part of that tendency. He proselytizes in a city, comes in, forms a small church, gives them rules for behavior and activity, and then lets them be. The, the epistles which Paul writes back to these churches try to resolve doctrinal or practical problems that have emerged here. One of the problems that comes in trying to interpret Paul is the fact that, unlike the other writers of the Gospel, Paul's letters are occasional pieces. They don't form one coherent narrative. For example, there is very little in Paul's writings about the actual historical events of Jesus' life. He talks about doctrine, talks about Christian faith and love, the theological virtues, but you don't hear very much about the actual miracles of Jesus or the signs of Jesus. For those, we would go to the Gospels. Now, of course, at the time that Paul is writing the epistles, he, uh, the Gospels don't exist yet. They have yet to be written. Paul's writings are the earliest material that we have for early Christian belief and early Christian activities. They are a sort of set, they are a set of historical documents which we can use to tease out important ideas about the origins and development of Christianity. Now, not only was he willing to undertake these missionary activities, these journeys, and devote his whole life to transferring the gospel across the Roman Empire to the world, as he put it. Ultimately, he is arrested and condemned to death. He is one of the martyrs for the faith. He is executed under Nero about the year 64. And it is very significant that he is not arrested until the end of his third journey, three being a very important number in the Bible, a particularly auspicious and heavenly number. But in addition, he is arrested in Jerusalem. He's not arrested in Antioch or Ephesus or any of the profane cities. Paul must go back to the original sacred city, the center, the, uh, the umphalos of Western religion. And when he goes back there, then he is in a position to have himself arrested. The symbolism of the sacred city and the making of the sacred city profane through Roman rule and Roman politics is very important for the life of Paul and for the martyrology behind him. Because he is a Roman citizen, which is a strange thing for an exponent of Christianity to be in some respects, he is he claims his rights as a Roman citizen is taken back to Rome, and there he is tried and eventually executed. The movement from the sacred city of God, Jerusalem, to the new Babylon, the new image of corrupt moral evil of an evil society, plays a big part in the Paul story. And the fact that he sends his final epistles from prison in Rome itself is full of poignant reference to the difference between what St. Augustine will call the city of God and the city of man. So Paul moves from the city of God to the city of man, but after being martyred, he is reunited with the eternal city of God and goes to meet his ultimate reward. So the Paul story in itself is an extremely poetic kind of a cycle, and he's a, a great icon of religious faith and religious fidelity. Now, since Paul was killed by the Romans, it's worth our thinking about how the Romans saw early Christianity. Why is it that the Romans were so dead set against it? Paul says in a number of his epistles that you should obey the temporal rulers, and Jesus says in the gospel that my kingdom is not of this world, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, raises the question of why it is the Romans were so dead set against it. And it's not easy or obvious to tell because there isn't very much evidence left for us from the first century um, after the death of Christ. Um, what we have suggests that the Romans thought 
that Christianity was just another mystery cult from the East. They were unable to separate Christianity from Isis or the cult of Mithras or any of the savior cults that had come into the Eastern Mediterranean from the Near East. So for them, it's kind of old hat. It's just another rabble-rousing mystery cult. They don't recognize the great spiritual progress that Christianity represents. And the reason why Christianity is different and perhaps even more alarming to the Romans than these other mystery cults is because of its eschatology. I mean, there is an element of moral freedom which equalizes both master and slave, and that's not contra contradictory to Roman outlooks. And there is also the emphasis on faith, hope, hope, and charity, which, while they are theological virtues, are very definitely not Roman virtues. Romans have a great set of virtues, but the theological virtues of Christianity are not those. The most important thing, though, that upset and worried the Romans is eschatology. Remember that Rome is eternal. The hubris of the empire builders had been such that they thought that they had created here in this world something that would last forever. It was their, their attachment to Rome, their deification of the emperor, was almost a sort of religious right in the name of power as opposed to the name of God, or they turned political power into something like a god. So Rome is the epitome of this worldly emphasis. It is the epitome of practicality. It is the epitome of power. It is the image of the city of man. Rome becomes the new Babylon in Christianity in the same way that the church is thought of as the new Israel. So. The Romans look at Christian eschatology and they say, this has to be stopped. It's bad enough that we get savior religions from the Near East every once in a while, but this is particularly dangerous because they are telling the lowest elements in society, because Christianity appeals to those who are dispossessed, who are outside of the confines of power. So the ones that the Romans are constantly taking advantage of, and God knows the Romans created a tremendous reservoir of human misery that Christianity could tap into. Well, one of the most important ways in which this human misery was used in the service of Christianity was tapping onto eschatological hopes and expectations. Eschatology is the logos of last things. What that means is that Christians expected the world to be imminent. They thought that it would happen within their lifetimes, any time. And for that reason, it meant that many of them would risk martyrdom because there isn't such a big danger in dying now if you get to go to heaven as opposed to hanging around for another month or another year, having God come down, end the world, and send you all to eternal hell. So the emphasis on martyrdom, the willingness to give up on this world, is greatly exacerbated by Christian eschatology. The expectation of the end of the world makes Christians an especially intractable group of people. Consider the... Uh, the, the analogy. Um, if you know uh, the history of Rome, you know the, the revolt led by Spartacus, the slave rebellion? Well, the Romans knew how to crush that. It was coming from the bottom of society. There were a tremendous number of people who were unhappy. The Romans knew how to take care of that. They crucified and killed and tortured a great many of the people that they had captured, crushed the rebellion ruthlessly, and the key thing is the Romans know how to handle a military conflict. You send in the legions and you kill off the opposition. Once the opposition has been killed and we've done terrible things to them, all others will be cowed. You won't see slaves rise again in the near future. The difference between the slave revolt of Spartacus and the peaceful revolt of the Christians is that if you kill them, it doesn't scare them nearly so much. A, because they think they're going to heaven and they become sanctified by this. B, they think that they're not missing very much because the world is about to end. So for the Romans, this is a nightmare. Um, Pliny, uh, in the, the first part of the second century, described uh, the Christian belief as a depraved superstition carried on to extravagant length. And that's the best the Romans could do with it. In addition to this depravity and this superstition, the little bit that the Romans had found out about Christian ritual and Christian belief horrified them. Remember that if you've ever played the game Telephone, when, uh, when a message gets transferred from one person to another person to another person, by, a time you get, by the time the Christian message gets to the leaders of Rome and to the local political elites, it has been garbled and been made very frightening and rather intimidating. There is this business of eating flesh and drinking blood. Now, that could very easily be misconstrued and taken in a non-symbolic way, 
In other words, the Romans thought that the Christians were involved in ritual cannibalism. And had you been running a Roman province too, you would certainly have inquired into it. And if it turned out not to be ritual cannibalism, it would still be rather fishy and potentially dangerous. These people are not reliable and they must be carefully observed. So minimally, the Christians are a suspicious group of people. They're from the bottom of society. They participate in very strange rituals. In addition, the early Christian churches often identified Jesus with other religious traditions that had already been in the Mediterranean basin, savior cults of various kinds. Uh, the god Dionysus is the god of the vine. Jesus is often closely associated with both wine and vines and rebirth, just the way Dionysus was. And in connection with the rituals of Dionysus, there were often orgiastic tendencies. In other words, sex in a promiscuous and kind of scandalous, obscene way. So, Orgies combined with cannibalism, combined with underclass discontent, made the Romans very upset and made them very nervous. In the fifth chapter of Corinthians, when Paul reproves the church in Corinth because a man is living with his father's wife, in other words, they're having an incestuous relationship and it's open, his need to address the sex lives of the early Christians may have been quite a pressing one. In other words, do not assume that Christians, because they had accepted the message of Christ from Paul, had been living in a way that nowadays we would associate with Christianity. Their behaviors and their mores may have been extraordinarily different. Remember, they don't have any of the Gospels. They haven't been written yet. The epistles of Paul are sent back there on an ad hoc basis trying to straighten things out. So it's worth keeping in, count, uh, in mind how the Romans look at early Christianity. It will make their treatment of Paul and the others a bit more comprehensible. I'm not trying to justify their atrocities. I'm trying to make you able to appreciate the problems that the Romans thought that they were dealing with. Now, it's also worth noting, before we move on to the actual epistles of Paul, how big the Christian church is. In the year 100, Christians make up less than 1% of the total Roman Empire. We think of them as being the, the cornerstone, the key, the focus of all religious and perhaps even political activity in the first century after the death of Christ. Nay, they are a despised and misunderstood and tiny minority. Even several centuries later, say, uh, Oh, 384, when Theodosius makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, Christians are still only perhaps 12 or 15 percent of the total empire. So it is, the process by which the Mediterranean basin and eventually Western Europe become Christian is a long-term, centuries-long event. It doesn't happen all at once, even though we may be tempted to think that, given the great importance that is, that is placed upon early Christianity and its relationship to the Gospels. Christianity is a tiny fraction of the Roman Empire at the time that Paul is working. Misunderstood and persecuted, but tiny and fugitive. Now, a number of epistles, or the epistles of Paul comp comprise a very large percentage of the New Testament. And there is some dispute among scholars as to which of the Pauline epistles are genuine. Some of them are thought to have been produced by Paul's secretaries, or Paul's imitators later on, or by people that were trying to glue together the Pauline tradition. So, for a number of reasons, um, we have to be kind of careful when we attribute these epistles to Paul because the authentic Pauline doctrine, while it may actually be reflected in them, may not be the same thing as the things that Paul himself authored. Now, when we look back at the Pauline epistles, it's hard to bring them all together, and there are seven that are admitted by pretty much all scholars to be genuine, and the difficulty in, in finding one unified appraisal of Paul is the fact, lies in the fact that systematic theology and practical ministry are two different enterprises. They're connected, but they're not identical. Paul was trying to set up the Christian church. He was trying to solve problems as they arose, often in an ad hoc manner, and often from a great distance. For that reason, he sometimes has to fudge an issue or expresses himself in an, is in an ambiguous way that could be taken more than one way. And what he's trying to do is create practical harmony. Well, it's often the case uh, uh, that Paul has a a or it's often ob observed that Paul has a unique temperament in the history of Christianity. He's the practical 
guy that gets things done. He's the one that makes churches go. If I were to say, if I were to look at all the writers of the New Testament, I might say that Paul is on one extreme because he's very early, but he's also very practical. He's certainly the only one of the uh, the writers in the New Testament that would feel comfortable in the middle of an epistle about love or about Christian charity or about faith or something, asking for a donation for the church for Jerusalem. In other words, if you have a few dollars, send this in. It's impossible to imagine, for example, the writer of the Gospel of John, ethereal right, and otherworldly as he is, to stop in the middle of his revelation and to ask for a few dollars or ask for a donation. Paul is the practical man that gets things done. So I think it's probably fair, charitable, and Paul would, would agree that being charitable towards him is probably a good idea, that the charitable reading of Paul takes into account the practical problems that he's trying to solve. And so I think that we'd be mistaken in holding him to too rigid an account of his theological views. And I'll try and do what I can to repair the seeming ambiguities or tensions towards the end of the lecture. But for now, let's see, see if we can't find a few things that we pretty much always find in Paul. Number one, there's a universal covenant. And certainly this is a carryover from the universal covenant that God made with Abraham, the covenant between Yahweh and his chosen people. And in some ways, this, the, the universality of the covenant is, is it prefigures what we're going to see later on in the Gospel of Luke, because the Gospel of Luke is the particular gospel which emphasizes the universality of the Christian message. Um, like Matthew, all right, uh, there's also, in addition, uh, a fulfillment of the Scripture. Remember that Paul had a rigorous theological education. He studied under one of the great living rabbis. He is a devout and very pious believer. So one of the things that he is going to try and do is show that there is at least some degree of continuity between the Old Covenant and the New, between the God of Abraham and the incarnated Jesus. He will be ambivalent about the connection between the old law and the new, but he will insist that there has to be some foundational connection between the two. A third thing we'll see in Paul, and this is also quite important, is we are moving towards the eschaton. The eschaton is the last event. It's the end of the world. Now, that's the kind of emphasis that we're going to see later on in the Gospel of Mark when that gets written. Remember that Paul is flying blind. He has as his sources things like oral tradition. He may well have known, for example, uh, the author of the Q document, which I will explain when I talk about the Gospel of Matthew, but he may have known the earliest figures in the church. He certainly moved in the circles that had access to Jesus himself. And for that reason, he has a certain degree of tension in his theology, yet the, his writings, in the, particularly in the epistles, we see the desire to make this a practical possibility, to glue together the disparate elements of the Jewish tradition and make it continuous with the jump into Christianity. Now, in addition to Paul's writings. It is possible, or in addition to Paul's authentic writings, there are some inauthentic writings. It's not quite certain which they are, but it is worth looking at them because they give us a very interesting and important access to the Pauline view of the world. Um, if we had to choose a standard, you know, the standard Pauline epistle by which all others are judged, it would be the, the, uh, the epistle to the Galatians. Now, Galatians uh, the, the question that is raised in Galatians, they send him because he started a church there, and the problem is this. There are some who want to say that Christian doctrine and Christian dogma is perfectly continuous with the law of Moses. If that were the case, then it would be necessary for believing Christians to accept, accept circumcision, and it would also be necessary for them to follow the Mosaic dietary laws, the same ones that we find in Leviticus. One faction said that, yes, there's perfect continuity between the law of Moses and the law of Christ. The other faction said, no, the law of Christ was a turning of the corner, and the law of Moses no longer applies or no longer applies in its full rigor. And Paul, being the practical-minded person that he was, and also the universalistic person that he was, goes for the latter idea. He says that Christians do not need to follow the Mosaic law in exactly the same respect, Right? It is possible to be a Christian without accepting, accepting circumcision. It is possible to be a Christian without following the Mosaic dietary laws. And I think that he, he's making one of the great and signal contributions to Christianity here, because one of the things that separates Christianity from Judaism, and also from Islam later on, strangely enough, is that Christianity is essentially not a legalistic religion. There is some degree of continuity with the law of Moses, but what we find out in the Christian message is that 
the Spirit giveth life, but the, the letter of the law killeth. And what Paul is doing here is saying that, look, we must move away from the letter of the Mosaic law and try and fulfill the spirit of it. If you fulfill the spirit of the law, then you can consider yourself a Christian. In doing this, he makes Christianity far more accessible to the peoples of the Mediterranean basin than it could possibly have been otherwise. And that means that for that reason, Paul is the single most important figure in getting this from being a small Jewish heresy to a great world religion. After Jesus himself, Paul is the most important figure here. He is interpreting the connection between Jesus' message and the Jewish tradition in such a way as to make it accessible to vast numbers of people who come from a plurality of religious traditions. Now, after uh, Galatians, and that's, that comes about 50, or 51, so it's very, very early. Um, the next of the undisputed Pauline epistles is 1 Corinthians, and this is certainly one of the greatest ones, and this is the one that always gets chosen as an example of Paul's thinking and Paul's ideas, and um, surely the most beautiful passage in Corinthians is the one on love, where he says that uh, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous or boastful, it is not arrogant or rude, love does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right, love bears all things, endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Paul is trying to create a universal, a universal ethos which will fill the Christian church and the Christian ethos will move from the church to society as a whole. We are trying to create a new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem will not be bounded by mere geography. We will turn the world into the sacred city. And the way in which we do that is by spreading this ethos of love across what he understands to be the world. So Paul's attempt to create a love ethos is one of the most moving and beautiful and poetic of his contributions to Christianity. And, of course, Paul being the kind of practical nuts and bolts thinker that he was, in addition to this lovely paean to, uh, uh, to love, which we see chapter 13, he goes beyond that and says, incidentally, while I'm telling you about love, let me reprove you about your sex lives because I have heard some scandalous things. It is in 1 Corinthians that he says that... Uh, monogamy, and particularly uh, it is better to marry than to burn, that this incestuous relationship that is existing publicly within the members of the church has got to be gotten rid of. Paul introduces, in addition to this ethos of love, a certain degree of asceticism. I wouldn't say he introduces it, but he, he emphasizes it. And he is clearly emphasizing the ascetic element in Christianity because he wants to establish the church as being different from the earlier traditions of Dionysian savior worship. And he also wants to take away the fuel which Roman persecutors will have if it turns out that they are scandalizing the society around them. Remember that the, Christi that, uh, the Christian message is identified with the city on the hill. You will be a light to all nations. You cannot be a light to all nations if your sex lives are publicly scandalous. So Paul has two things to do. One, at the, in, this, and in, in one in the same book, uh, book, 1 Corinthians, he is writing a letter trying to straighten out the sex lives of Christians, which apparently needs some straightening out. At the same time, he's writing one of the great testimonies to love in the Christian sense of agape rather than eros. So Paul is doing several things at the same time, and in some cases it may be that some of the letters which are attributed to Paul as being authentic are sewn together. For example, I would not be surprised if 1 Corinthians was a redaction from several letters that he may have wrote. It is generally believed by scholars that 2 Corinthians, which is acknowledged also to be general, uh, genuinely Paul, um, is a composite of several letters. And what he does in these letters is try and go back to the Corinthian problem. He uh, discusses his own ministry. He discusses in particular the idea that Christian life is a new creation. In the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, the idea that Christian life recreates the entire world will turn out to be a very important theme for the development of Christianity in the first century. I will talk about that in some detail when I come to the Gospel of John. Now, his other well-known, his other acknowledged uh, genuine letters are 
of varying degrees of interest and quality. Certainly the most important of these, though, is Romans. It's written late in his life, and many people hold the view that Paul's epistle to the Romans represents his best thought out attempt to create a coherent theology. Certainly Martin Luther thought that. Luther loved the idea that faith alone justifies us, and whenever he was called into conflict with the Catholic Church, he would always trot out Romans as being the most important document of his conception of religious faith. So, in Romans, Paul says, first off, that fallen humanity is sinful across the board. In other words, people are intrinsically depraved and intrinsically sinful. We are all in bondage to this world. In other words, such is the nature of the human condition. But, he says, that sin can be redeemed through the grace of God when people choose to accept Christ crucified and the new Christian law, um, and when they choose to accept baptism, they are given the chance to break away from the bondage to this world. They are given the chance to develop what Luther would later call Christian liberty. One is not liberated from the bondage to sin until you accept the Christian message in Paul's view. When that happens, then and only then do you become completely possessed of free will and free choice. Prior to that, you are in the chains of this world. Once you accept baptism and you accept the Christian message, there is no guarantee, I'm afraid, that you will not be sinful and not be chained to this world, but the possibility of sanctification, the possibility of choosing the right, emerges only in the context of the Christian message. At least that is Paul's view. And he gives one of the canonical and most beautiful of the references to uh, faith in the first chapter, verse 17 of Romans. And he emphasizes, in addition to, the, uh, to faith as being canonical and central to the Christian experience, that this is one of the things, one of the main anchors which connects Christianity and the Jewish tradition. He gives Abraham as the exemplary figure in the, uh, as an image of Christian faith, because Christian faith is not so do different from Jewish faith. It is a Christian, is Jewish faith with an important theological addition, an important turning of the theological corner. But Abraham is the great figure of religious faith for Paul, and that, that, there's a certain tension emerges, particularly in Romans, because sometimes it seems that Paul says that the law is perfectly continuous between uh, uh, the Hebrew Bible and the Greek Testament. Sometimes it seems that there's a, a bit of a disjunction. It's not easy to read. So he vacillates back and forth on the question of the law, but faith never changes. There are a few things you can be sure of in Paul, and faith is certainly one of them. Now, there is a, a certain problem and contradiction, right? We find in the Pauline epistles certain passages which could easily be read in antagonistic or opposite ways. If you finesse them a little bit and interpret them a little bit, you can make them fit, but it requires a certain act of charity. Fortunately for Paul, for us, Paul is the one who helped canonize and formulate the theological virtues, and charity ranks very high among them. So in some ways, this is one of those books that tells you how to read it, it introduces itself to you, and tells you the spirit in which it ought to be approached. Um, now, when we move from the letters which are clearly from Paul to the ones which are spurious but important, we do get to some material that is certainly important and has a, a great deal of impact on the understanding of the Christian message that will emerge. For example, in, um, when we look to Colossians, uh, that, if real, is probably Paul's last epistle. If it is genuine, if he really wrote that while he was imprisoned in Rome, it probably comes perhaps oh, 62 just before he's going to be killed. And Paul to the Colossians emphasizes faith, hope, and charity as being the central virtues of Christian life. And he says the greatest of these is charity. Charity is certainly going to be associated with this new love ethos that he is trying to establish among Christian believers. And it is also worth thinking about the fact that faith is clearly one of the borrowings that we're going to have that is going to establish the continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And faith will be sort of the foundation of the theological virtues, utterly indispensable. Charity will be somehow the fruit, and the connection between faith and charity will be hope. And it is worth thinking about hope as a virtue, because not every religious or philosophical tradition treats hope as being a virtuous thing. This is one of the true contributions of Christianity, and this emphasis on hope is certainly one of the most important contributions of Paul. Compare the idea of hope that we see in the Christian tradition to the idea of hope that we get, say, in ancient Greece. In ancient Greece, hope 
was the best of the vices. If you know the, um, the myth of Pandora's box, when she opens the, pan the box and lets all the evils out into the world, she slams it shut. And when she does so, there's one thing caught in, and she, it says, let me out, let me out. So she opens the box, and out it comes. It turns out that what comes out of the box last, out of the box of vices, is hope. For the Greeks, hope was one of those strange qualities which straddles the line between virtue and vice. They would be unwilling to commit themselves to hope as a virtue. Christianity stands that on its head. It is unequivocal in its affirmation that hope is a virtue. This is one of the things which will distance the tradition of Jerusalem from the tradition of Athens. And Paul is the one who says that hope is the connection between faith and love. And what do we hope for? We hope for the resurrection, we hope for salvation, and we hope for the gradual extension of this love ethos until it replaces and supplants the cruel and wicked regime of Rome. The Romans were not so far wrong in thinking that Christianity was subversive. It was not subversive in a military or directly political sense. It was subversive in the sense that it offered an alternative set of values, an alternative tablet of good and evil. And this tablet of good and evil turned out to be unstoppable. Because if you stop and think about what the Roman Empire was like, it created a tremendous reservoir of human misery. And to unequivocally affirm that hope is a virtue liberates the emotional force of that misery. People who have previously been despairing of their lot in life now believe that there will be an ultimate final justice and a final reckoning in which one God who creates a universal moral law will judge the wicked Romans and their cohorts. The last shall be the first and the first shall be the last. The emphasis on hope in Christianity makes it possible to turn it into a, va to, into a mass political movement that takes advantage of the psychic tendencies of Roman oppression. And po uh, Paul's contribution here is most signal in Colossians, and surely that's the most important thing in, the, the, in that particular piece. If Paul himself did not write it, it seems to me that it is genuinely Pauline. Many times people make quite a bit of, of the fact that some of the Pauline epistles are spurious. It appears that they could not actually have been written by Paul. May I suggest that that's not as important an issue as one might think? If it is not by Paul himself, it is certainly the sincerest form of flattery. It is certainly written by someone that has interests that are congruent to Paul's own interests. It is certainly written by someone that intends to advance the cause that Paul himself was committed to. So if it, his, some of the, uh, the spurious epistles had been written by Barnabas or Apollos or any of the people that had been working with Paul, it seems to me that it doesn't make much difference. In the same way that Isaiah is a composite of more than one author, and yet we still routinely talk about the Isianic tradition, the emphasis on apocalyptic thought, and the things that hold the various parts of Isaiah together. May I suggest that the distinction between the true and the spurious epistles of Paul is not all that great. We don't get much conceptual clarity by separating them because Paul himself is ambivalent and ambiguous. On the other hand, when we bring them together, we get a fuller and richer and deeper understanding of what Paul was trying to do. And that, I think, is what makes them valuable. And that's why I'm glad that they've been kept in the canon despite the advances of modern scholarship. Without taking anything away from the skeptics, it seems to me that the fact that, he may, that Paul may not have written all of these uh, epistles may not make all that much difference. Now, I want to finish up in thinking about Paul by looking at the question of the universal law. It is very clear that Christian hope aspires towards or gestures towards a universal moral relation between all the peoples of the earth. In some ways, this is an extrapolation from the universalistic tendencies of Judaism. And because Paul had always been a devout and pious believer, the transition may not have been as great as one might imagine. And yet, there are times when Paul is also trying to say that there is something fundamentally different. For example, it is very clear that, that the Mosaic law requires the dietary laws be observed, requires circumcision, requires a whole slew of ritual observances which Paul says it is possible to go beyond. I would be inclined to say that he is making pragmatic equivocations and that that's why we will see these conflicts within individual epistles like Romans. Romans is all over the road. Sometimes it says that faith alone by itself is sufficient and that will save you. Other times it, sees, it seems that faith will be an outgrowth of our fidelity to the Mosaic Law and that the Mosaic Law is indispensable but perhaps just a first stage. 
the tensions within Paul have caused all kinds of tensions within Christianity because it served certain political purposes, of, or actually a, a variety of political purposes over the centuries of the development of Christianity. And Paul is very much a man of his time. He got the job done then, but one of the, the legacies of his ambiguity and equivocations is internal strife within, within Christian belief. So I'd be inclined to say that practical necessity causes his ambivalence. Ministry and systematic theology are separate. Paul combines them as well as anyone ever does, so far as I can tell, but in an intellectual way, it is not entirely satisfactory. On the other hand, and this is worth stressing, stressing too, although Paul waffles on the question of the law and on the, question, and on the connection between the Mosaic law and the new law of Jesus, he never waffles on universality. From first to last, Paul is the apostle to the world. It is intrinsically a, a universal message. We have a universal law which God intends to extend to all peoples, and when Jesus tells his disciples to go and preach to all nations, Paul is, re is recognizing that fact in his treatment of universality. Uh, it's very different from the synoptics, for example. Matthew wishes to maintain a pretty close connection between the Jewish tradition and the new Christian religion, or new Christian ex extrapolation from that tradition. Mark also has a considerable degree of continuity between Judaism and Christianity, or between a, not, not just Judaism and Christianity, but also it's relatively insular. Many more references in Matthew and in, in Mark to the actual facts of the law. Paul wants to go beyond the law. He wants to go from the letter to the spirit. And perhaps that's our best way of characterizing what Paul symbolizes. He is turning the letter of the law into a spirit. And if we don't press the letter of the law too hard, we can find that the spirit will be sufficient. In some ways, Paul is willing to tell us that if you have grasped the message of Jesus, if you understand what the fruit of the Christian message is, you need not concern yourself especially with the rind. Um, Paul's final message on this comes in 1 Corinthians and is probably the greatest of his small utterances on the universality of Christian doctrine and belief. He says in uh, chapter 12, um, this is verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, and all were made to drink of one spirit.